today we're going to talk about um, well UMD of course but particularly non-examples of UMD spaces because we've given a bunch of examples we know for example that let's just write examples Hilbert spaces are UMD LP spaces for p between one and infinity they're UMD or also Bochner spaces associated with UMD spaces. So if X is UMD and P is between one and infinity, these are all examples of UMD spaces. And what else do we know? We know that the UMD property doesn't depend on which exponent P you use when you define it. So all of these UMD P properties are equivalent. That's what we've done up to now. I think we did the Gundy decomposition, which proved this P independence but we still know very little about non-examples. How do you prove that a space is not UMD? And there's a couple of ways you can do this. And we're gonna show one technique that's pretty effective and gives us basically all of the non-examples that we need. <coughs> what we're gonna do is we're going to look at, uh, we'll look at finite dimensional L1 spaces call it L1N, and I'll just define this. This is the space of sequences with N elements. So I'll index them from one to N, sequences of scalars with the L1 norm. So you just sum up all the elements. That's L1N. L1N is just the scalar field to the N with the L1 norm. If you prefer to think of them as n-dimensional vectors rather than sequences on n points, it's the same thing. You've dealt with Rn before, you've dealt with Cn, you know what this is. But the key thing is that we equip it with this norm, the L1 norm, not the Euclidean one, not the L2, but L1. Someone needs to mute themselves. Who's just come on? I can do that. Mute all. There we go, I think. All right. So we're gonna look at the L1 space. This is n-dimensional. You can see that that's n-dimensional. It's Kn. And because it's finite dimensional, it's UMD. So this isn't a non-example of a UMD space, of course. Every finite dimensional space is isomorphic to a Hilbert space and therefore it's UMD. So the question here about finite dimensional L1 spaces is not whether or not they're UMD, but how bad is the UMD constant? So remember we have this constant that appears in the definition of UMD. And what we're gonna see is that it blows up in N, which is gonna ultimately be used to show that infinite dimensional L1 spaces are not UMD. <laughs> That's how we're gonna do that. So let's state the theorem. I've kind of upgraded this to a theorem. Perhaps this is a lemma or a proposition. I think it's difficult enough to prove that we should call it a theorem. Um, let's get my quantifiers right. Yeah, for all p between one and infinity, there exists a constant c greater than zero, such that for all dimensions n, the UMD p constant b to p of LPN, no, of L1N, sorry. So remember, we have this constant in the definition of the UMDP property, B to P. This constant is greater than some constant times log of N. And let's say log base two, just to be precise. Although you can change that base of the log up to changing this constant C. So basically the UMD constants of n-dimensional L1 spaces blow up at least logarithmically in N. I'm not going to say anything about upper bounds because I don't care too much about upper bounds here, but you can, of course, bound this from above as well. But the lower bound is what's interesting to us. Uh, is anybody unsure what I mean by this constant beta sub p? It'll come up in the proof. So if you don't remember the exact definition, you'll, you'll see it in the proof. I'm not going to surprise you with that. So we, let's, let's prove this. Uh, first, let's just note it suffices 
to work with, so let's take a capital N and let's prove this result, not for every dimension N, but just for the powers of two. That's gonna be enough. We need to prove that the UMD constant of the two to the N dimensional L1 space is greater than some constant C times N because that's log two of two to the N, yeah? The reason that's enough is that in general, if we take the M dimensional L1 space, then we can actually say, well, if M is greater than two to the N, then the two to the N dimensional L1 space actually embeds in the M dimensional L1 space. So the UMD constant of L1M will be greater than or equal to the UMD constant of L1 of dimension two to the log two M, making sure that log two M is an integer by taking the floor function of that. And we're gonna prove that that is greater than or equal to C times log two M floor. And that will be greater than some constant C tilde, I guess C on two will do here times log two M. So because we have some constant out the front that we don't care too much about, it's gonna to suffice to consider the powers of two as our dimension. We don't need to work with every dimension. That's gonna simplify things. All right. So we prove this in a very roundabout way. We don't directly construct a martingale valued in L1, two to the N, but we construct some auxiliary martingales and then extract the, the bad martingales from that one. It's not a very direct proof. Let's consider the probability space omega that we've dealt with many times before. It's a product, let's take with indices k from one to infinity. We're gonna start with one instead of zero here for reasons that are not too important. We're gonna take the product of this two point space with a probability measure as we've done before. where we put the uniform probability on each factor and then take the product probability measure. And we have our coordinate functions, pi sub k, mapping this product into plus and minus one. And we will let x be the Banach space L1 of omega. And you might think, why are we introducing another Barnack space here? We're supposed to be working with, with L1, the two to the n dimensional L1 space. Actually, we're gonna construct our martingales here and we're gonna then restrict down to a certain subspace of this, which is going to be isometric to the space we actually care about. So as I said, we're not gonna do it very directly. It's an indirect proof. Uh, so recall, we defined this X valued martingale F bullet. We defined it like this. Um, we did this weeks ago, so you've probably forgotten it. I better write out the definition. So this is F sub N. We take one plus pi K of omega times pi K, which is in X. We also define f of zero just to be constant one. We were looking at this martingale a while back when we were dealing with the radon nicotine property, I think, because we used this in showing that uh, that X capital L one of omega doesn't have the radon nicotine property. So this particular martingale here has got some sort of pathological properties that we can exploit and we can also exploit them here to show that this lower bound for the UMD constant of two to the N dimensional L one. So this is a martingale. I think I asked you to show that at one point uh, with respect to the filtration A, which was generated by the coordinate functions pi or the sequence of coordinate functions pi n. So we're gonna have a look at this martingale and we're gonna see what this will tell us 
What do I want to show here? Now we fix our dimension, well, not our dimension, the log of the dimension n. Let's fix n greater than or equal to one. And let's prove the result for this n. Key ob well, one of the key observations in this proof is that the functions f1, well, actually f0, f1, up to fn, these are all functions of the coordinate maps pi one up to pi n. You can see by the definition, they're all written in terms of these pi's. So they are all a n measurable because a n is a filtration generated by these coordinate maps. And in particular, any function of these functions that generate that, that filtrate, that, sorry, that sigma algebra will be measurable with respect to that sigma algebra. So we're dealing with an measurable functions, having fixed n. And we also know that the sigma algebra a n is generated by two to the n atoms of equal measure. These are the two to the n sets where these functions pi one up to pi n take their different values. So there's two to each one of these pi i's has two different possibilities, plus or minus one, and you have n of them. So ultimately you've got two to the n different possibilities for the value of the vector pi one up to pi n. And the set on which these n functions equal that particular value, that's one of the atoms. So we have two to the n atoms, they've all got equal probability. What is it? Two to the minus n because we're on a probability space. Yeah. And what that tells us in a sort of roundabout way is that the functions that we're dealing with, f0, f1 up to fn, uh, take values in a subspace, which we'll call z, subspace z of x, which is L1. And this subspace Z is isometric to L1 of dimension two to the N. Basically, we've got a bunch of functions that are measurable with respect to a certain sigma algebra. That sigma algebra has got two to the N atoms. So you've only got two to the N possible values in a sense you can take. Well, that's not really, that's not true. That's not how it works. But whenever you take an L1 norm over these two to the N atoms, you're basically just taking the sum of the values over those two to the N points any integral over a finite atomic sigma algebra, right? It's just a sum over the atoms. Is anybody confused about that? This is the probably the most confusing part of the proof. And if anyone's unsure about this, it's a good idea to speak up and we can clarify it. I'll just draw a little picture in case anybody doesn't want to speak up. Our sigma algebra looks like this. We have two to the end of these sets, they're atoms, and any function which is measurable with respect to the sigma algebra as, sorry, what was that? May I ask a question? So, so is it the L1 omega that is, I, so the integral we take is not on, is, is on L1 of x, right? Uh, yeah, so we're look, yeah, so we're looking at functions that are in L1 of, uh, hang on. Yeah, we're looking at L1 of omega valued in X, actually. So this is where all of the Fs are. But all of these functions are actually measurable on this sigma algebra um, a, a sub N. So they actually look like this. They're constant on every one of these, these atoms. And when you take the integral of such a function, you basically just take the sum over the atoms and then sum the values. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But yes. So basically, what we're doing is we're changing the x in here to to z. It is a little bit confusing. I accept that. But this is the basic idea. We can always come back to it. Or you can think about it more in the notes. But this is the the point here. <laughs> 
So our functions are valued in X, but actually they're valued in a particular subspace of X, the subspace of functions that are measurable. I guess you can say L1 of, they're actually in L1 of A sub N, and this is isometric to L1 with two to the endpoints. Maybe that makes more sense. That's, yeah, that is actually clearer, yes. <laughs> Right, so what this tells us is that for all sequences of signs, uh, which xi n, n from zero to n, uh, from zero, yep. If we take the sum of the martingale differences dfn with signs xi n, so this is the kind of thing you do in the UMD property, when you look at that in LP of omega valued in X. So remember X is L1 of omega. Now we're taking LP of omega valued in L1 of omega here. This will be equal to the same thing, but where you replace X with Z, this subspace in which all of these functions actually live. And that is less than or equal to the UMD constant in LP of Z times F of capital N. Because we're looking at Z valued martingales here. And because Z is isometric to L1, we have L1 two to the N here. And this we can rewrite as F sub N valued in X. So this is where the UMD constant of the two to the n dimensional L1 space pops up. That's how we see it within L1 of omega somehow. And yeah, in case you forgot the, the definition of the UMD constant, that's what it was. And this will let us get a lower bound because we have this less than or equal to here on this UMD constant. If we compute everything that appears here. So yeah, we need to compute these terms that appear. We need to compute this one, or at least we need to estimate this from below and we need to compute this or at least estimate it from above. So let's deal with the right-hand side. This is the easier term to deal with because this LP norm is actually one and it's not even too hard to see that. In fact, whenever you take a point in the probability space, you take an omega and you fix an n. If you take the value of the martingale at time n and you measure that in x, you just do a pointwise estimate for every omega and this will work out. What is this? x is L1, so we have an integral over omega here. k from 1 to n. 1 plus pi k of omega pi k of another variable eta and we integrate that in eta. This is just L1 of, this is the definition of Fn. The X norm is the L1 norm of that. We have these two variables lying around. Omega is fixed, eta is the L1 variable. Everything is positive, so we don't need to take absolute values. Not negative at least. And the key thing in this computation is you look at this term here and you see that the sequence for fixed omega, pi k omega pi k, as k varies in the natural numbers, has the same distribution as the sequence pi k. This is like what we were doing all the time with Rademacher sequences. Actually, this is a Rademacher sequence, in fact. We have a Rademacher sequence and we've just multiplied it by a bunch of plus or minuses one, plus or minus ones arbitrarily. And that doesn't change any of the distribution or properties of that sequence. It's still a Rademacher sequence. It's a different Rademacher sequence, but it's another Rademacher sequence. So every integral of these functions, because that only depends on the distribution, this integral doesn't care whether we put those signs out the front. So we have this, where the omega is now vanished, yeah? 
So now we know that these things are independent. This is a Rademacher sequence after all. Rademacher sequences consist of independent random variables. Of course, you can see that directly because they're coordinate maps and coordinate maps in products are always independent. So the integral of the product is a product of the integrals. And you can compute that, that's one. Yeah, because every one of these integrals is one. It's the integral of one, which is one, plus the integral of a plus minus one with probability one half each way. And that's that integral zero. <laughs> So this whole thing, this product is one. So for every omega, the norm in X of this martingale, that omega is one or this random variable. So in particular, when you integrate the pth power of that, you take the LP norm of that, it's still one. You're doing it over a probability space after all. So this right-hand side is one and we can write in full, Xi n dfn in LP valued in X is less than or equal to this UMD constant times one. And we have that. Which is looking good for a lower bound on this UMD constant. We don't have any term on the right hand side anymore to deal with. We just have to estimate the left hand side now which is a little bit trickier. We can't simplify it quite so simply. We do a similar argument though. We're gonna do a pointwise estimate for omega and show that we can remove the omega again using the same argument, but we're not gonna get something as simple as, we're not gonna get the exact estimate we need yet. I'll write that out. Let's take DFN of omega in X and that's right what that is. So just as before we have this L1 norm over Omega and we have our sum N from zero to N, Xi N, <coughs> but now we have this different sequence. Remember this FN was defined in terms of a product. So I've got a product from of K from one to N minus the same product K from one to N minus one. And we can take out the first N minus one factors of that and then have a difference. Let's write it out explicitly. We'll have to sum up to n minus one. So this is the, the nth term here. One plus pi k, pi k. Then we'll have the missing nth term that appears in the, so it's dfn, so we have fn minus fn minus one. This is fn minus one, fn, the missing term is this, pi n, pi n, we'll have minus one. And I need to put an absolute value here. Look at that for a moment and just convince yourself that this is correct. We have the minus one here coming from the minus fn minus one term. This is the fn term, this times that, all good. Of course, this one and this minus one cancel each other out. So we can write that out as the sum with the signs. We write this part out again. Actually, I won't write that out yet. Again, we see the same thing where we have pi k of omega times pi k of eta appearing. And this, as before, this is a sequence that's got the same distribution as the pi k's without the omega multiplier at the front. So we can actually even remove them from the integral. Exactly as before. So this simplifies to one plus pi k of eta. And here we've got pi n of eta integrated in eta. So the omega is gone. Again, this whole thing is omega invariant actually. And this thing has got exactly the same form as the thing we started with. So actually what we can do is we can write this as the integral of a sum Xi n dGn, where I have to define what G is. 
So what is G? G is a martingale, scalar valued. It's a martingale on omega and Gn is the product of k from one to n of one plus pi k. So this is the analogous thing to what we had before, but now we don't have this extra multiplier at the front because now this isn't a vector valued multiplier. It's not a vector valued martingale anymore. This is now a scalar valued martingale. And it's a bit simpler. Is anybody not convinced of that? I haven't been very careful in handling the n equals zero term of this difference here. You actually should be writing that out separately and making sure it does what it should, but it, it does what it should here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So where are we now? So now what we have to do is estimate from below. So what we're looking at is this. Uh, we're having a fixed omega here. Then let's take the supremum over all possible choices of signs. Because we have uh, an arbitrary choice of signs here. And if we can estimate the supremum from below, then we can estimate any of them from below. Uh, no, we can't do that. We're going to take a supremum because we're free to take, we are free to pick a choice of signs here. So we can in particular take the maximal one. Yep. That's what we need to do. Sorry, I just confused myself here. Looking at this estimate here that we've got, if we want to bound this UMD constant from below and make it as large as possible, then we want to make this left-hand side as large as possible. So we take the supremum over choices of signs on the left-hand side. Because you can take them all to be one or something like that, and then it'll make it too small. You make it bigger by picking the right choice of signs. Sorry? Yep. Uh, do we know that we can uh, take the supremum after plugging in some omega? Um, well, it turns out it's independent of omega. You see here that actually for all omega, for any choice of signs, okay, it turns yeah. out it's independent uh, of omega. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, true. I've got to be more clear on that. There's everything here is omega independent. That's what we use. Yeah. Actually, yeah, that's going to be the next line. This is actually the supremum over all choices of signs of, let me write it out properly. Yep. Yeah, I'm writing it out like that. I have two, by the way, I've got two probability spaces omega lying around. They don't have to exactly be the same. <laughs> you know, here they are. Yeah. Right. So what you can do here is you can say I'm bounding this from below. I can actually lower bound the supremum over all choices of signs by the average over all choices of signs. So I'll take an expectation of any Radomacher sequence, epsilon, and everything's still valid in L1. So let's say epsilon is a Radomacher sequence on a probability space, let's call it omega prime, just to be clear that it's not the same space, it doesn't need to be the same space. So this is average over all signs, and this is the supremum over all signs, and of course the average is bounded by the supremum. Yeah. So plugging that into our estimate for the UMD constant, this UMD constant is greater than or equal to the supremum over all choices of signs. Of this Martingale transform here. And now we're integrating over omega, but we saw that everything was actually omega invariant. So all of these LP norms vanish, basically. So now we have this Radomacher average in L1. 
that's where we are. And what can we do with that? We actually know what Rada marker averages in L1 look like because we computed this a couple of lectures back. We have this, it depends on, there's a constant, doesn't depend on anything using Kinchin's inequality. Is this, this isn't Kinchin, this is Gahan Kinchin. One of the consequences of Gahan Kinchin. Um, a Rada marker average in L1 is actually the L1 norm of a square function because now we're actually looking at Radamacher averages of scalar valued functions. We know what these are. We have equivalence there. I guess some people might've forgotten that little lemma that we did at one point, Radamacher averages in LP spaces can be identified with square functions. So the LP norm of the, the square sum on the inside up to a constant. So we now have to estimate this thing from below. But we can do that. That we can actually do explicitly. How do we do that? We define some sets. Omega sub K. This is for, let's write it as one less than or equal to K less than or equal to N minus one. It's a set of omegas such that omega one equals omega two equals dot 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 equals omega K equals one. Then omega K plus one is minus one. So we look at the set of points omega here such that you have minus one for the first time at K plus one. We'll see in a moment why we, why we make this definition, why we do this. These sets are disjoint, as you can see from the definition. You can't have your first minus one at two different times at the same time, so they're disjoint. So this L1 norm that we need to estimate from below is greater than or equal to the sum over these sets. So the sum from M from one to N minus one of the integral over omega M that we just defined. And we can also say this is greater than or equal to the sum from N equals one up to N, just throwing away a positive number. Doesn't change your lower bounds. Of the square function here. Yep, this is true. We've thrown away a bunch of information here. We don't care what happens outside these sets. We don't care what happens at n equals zero. They don't really contribute. You can optimize your lower bounds constant by adding in all of these terms, but it doesn't change the order of growth. And what we care about is the order of growth in M. So we still have to evaluate and estimate this difference here. And if you write it out, I'll write out what the answer is and then we can derive it if you want to see the derivation. This is true. Maybe I should write this out. I'll write it out explicitly. So as before, we have a, a product up to N. So GN is the product up to N of one plus pi K or whatever. And we take a product up to N minus a product up to N minus one. We have the product up to n minus one, one plus pi k omega times the term at n minus one. We did this sort of thing before. These vanish. Your pi n, and this here is g n minus one. Yeah, good. And this doesn't contribute to the absolute value because that's plus or minus one. And what is GN minus one? So let's write that out. I already had it written out. We have a product of terms that are either two or zero. And if you get any zeros, the product vanishes. And if you don't have any zeros, then the product is two to the N minus one. So this is actually two to the N minus one. <laughs> 
characteristic function, the set where omega one equals omega two, etc., up to omega n minus one, and these are all equal to one. Is this clear? Everyone believes that? Good. So we can go back to here and say that this is equal to the sum in M, omega M, sum in N. So now we have two to the N minus one squared. So this is two to the two N minus two. And we have this characteristic function. This was the nth term. So yep, this is all right. Get a one half here, integrate in omega. All right. And what does this tell us? What can we say here? This characteristic function here is basically saying, okay, the first minus one that occurs has to occur at least at n because omega one up to omega n minus one are all one. But we're integrating this over omega m. This tells us that the first minus one occurs at m plus one. So this is saying n minus one is less than or equal to m. If that is correct, I've written this in my notes. This is, what's this saying? Omega m plus one is equal to minus one. This made sense to me when I wrote it. I have to think about it again because it's not immediately obvious, but you just have to play around with the indices and eventually you see, yeah, this is true, right? Yeah, n minus one is less than m because omega m is equal to one. That's the key thing. And you know that your n minus one term is also one. So n minus one has to be less than or equal to m. Omega m is the last index for which you have a one because m plus one is the first index for which you have a minus one. Think about it anyway. you like, everybody's got their own little way of internalizing this that it makes perfect sense eventually. Yeah. If these conditions aren't satisfied, then the characteristic function vanishes basically. Yeah. So what I'm really trying to say here is that this is the integral over omega m of the sum from n equals one up to m plus one of two to the two n minus two. And then there's no characteristic function anymore. Right. So we keep computing. This is the probability of omega m because now we're just integrating a constant over a set. And let's write this as n from zero to m. So this is two to the two n minus two. So that's two times n minus one. So we can just re-index this whole thing. So we have two to the two n, that's four n, four to the n. So what's this probability here? <laughs> what was the definition of omega m? You have, m plus one conditions in defining this set. The first term is one, the second term is one, the mth term is one, the m plus first term is minus one. And each of these things happen with probability one half independently. So this is the sum of two to the minus m minus one. Let's write m plus one conditions, yeah. Let's just write a squiggle. This sum of four to the n from n from zero to m is basically four to the m up to a constant. Might even be four to the m, I can't remember to be honest. I always think of this as being four to the m. But then you have a one half power. Let's say that's basically two to the m. That'll do. Should I have a plus one there? Maybe I should. Ah, I've, got the, I've got this squiggle here. So if I'm slightly wrong, it doesn't matter. Everything's true up to a constant. This is definitely true. These squiggles save you all the time. As a consequence, I'm really bad at exact computations. <laughs> Everything's up to a constant. Anyway, uh, this is basically one up to a constant. <laughs> and we have basically n terms. <laughs> so n minus one, that's basically n. As long as we say for n large, this is true. Maybe it's false at n equals one or something. But anyway, this is, we only need this for n large. That's actually all we needed to prove because what we've shown in the end is 
that this is greater than or equal to up to a constant n. Okay, and that's done. So am I right? I mean, you did this random choice of signs. Could you just have taken the alternating signs? I think that might have worked as well. Have, I'm not sure it would have, have been a faster computation, but I think- Maybe not, yeah. I mean, I can't help seeing here somehow the Dirac Delta is floating around. Yeah, it kind of is, because you see and, that we've got this sort of thing happening. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now these are then these are then uh, more the half functions, right? When you take if you have a Dirac delta at one point and you take the martingale differences of this Dirac delta, then you get the half functions near this point. Yeah, and this that looks what like what's happening. Here. But, but somehow I can't help seeing that uh, you have unboundedness of either the Hilbert transform or the Martingale. You're getting all of these things, all of the ideas are here. What this is basically giving you, if you read the proof a different way or whether you just modify it a bit, it's like, you're gonna get the Hardy composition is not unconditional in L1. That's kind of uh, yeah, what's happening. Yeah. You're gonna see the fact that the Hilbert transform is not bounded in L1, right? That's it, it, you, have, you, have, you yeah. have done it all here, yeah. It's all sort of the core of it's in here somewhere, yeah. So I think you what you are doing is you have this, um, I mean, you, you're trying, you have this LP outside, right? But then you're mm -hmm. inside, you have L1 of omega and somehow you're yeah. pushing down the martingale differences from the outside to yeah. the inside. Uh, yeah, the thing I wanted to highlight, some, there was two things I want to highlight in particular in the proof. One is the thing that you're sort of mentioning here is that everything here is omega independent. So yeah. even though you're looking at LP valued in X, outside, ultimately you're just yeah. looking at L1. Right. So this is really all just L1 estimates, scalar valued L1 estimates. The other is that by taking an arbitrary choice of signs, you can freely just say the supremum of all signs is greater than the average. And you don't actually care which one supremum is because you can evaluate that average as a square function. And even the average case is bad enough actually. Because actually the, the thing we're estimating from below is the average and that's large enough to give you this blow up. So what it's telling you is that an average choice of signs will do this for you. So chances are most choices of signs you pick, as long as they're not special somehow, will work for this. Yeah. Absolutely. On average, you yeah. get this blow up. Yeah. 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 So yeah, it's a nice little proof. We'll have the break now. Are there more questions before the break? Seems not. After the break, we'll show that infinite dimensional L1 spaces are not UMD, although we already have all the ingredients for that. That's not hard to do. We'll talk a bit about square functions for martingales, and we'll talk a bit about the Radon-Nikodian property again, and then we should be done. So let's take our break.